And does anybody need, uh, I've got a couple extras of these guys. If you want to use one. We were talking about this concept of estimating equations again, something you guys have been working with all along. Um, I, I got a question in office hours yesterday actually about this expression up here. Note that when I'm talking about this sum, this expectation is not included in that sum, okay? So that little i that's there, it's, it's poor notation on my part, I'm going to fix that, but that little i that's there is not relative to that index, okay? So that just means I've got iid sampling, this is one randomly sampled observation that's out of there, okay? Yeah. All right, so I would set this guy over here, so I'd set that sample uh, mean over to the population. Okay, just to make sure that that's clear for everybody. Good. And again, we've talked about this concept of, of quasi-likelihood. Um, this is what I've been trying to, to emphasize with you guys with respect to the Hebrew-White estimation. It's this kind of, it's this concept of saying, well, start with your good old exponential family, bring down some sort of score estimating equation, but then really just think about it as an estimating equation at that point, right? Don't, don't, don't necessarily believe where it was derived from. Just say, can I, this, can I say something about the properties of the estimators that are derived from setting that particular guy, this function, to equal to zero, okay? Um, and again, that's kind of credited to Wedderburn back in the day where he kind of said, look, if we look at this exponential family theory, well, when I get down to it at the heart of the, at the end of the day, really all I'm doing is making some sort of a statement about the first and second moments. Well, the first moment is the thing I care about, so I'm always going to have to make some statement about that. Usually the thing I care about, put it that way, qualify my statement. And now I just have to make one additional assumption on the variance. Okay. Through. And then Hubert White kind of came through and said, and if you're wrong about the variance, then this is what we can do to fix up the inference at the end of the day. Okay. Again, so if you think about the big paradigm, you kind of got full likelihood theory over here, parametric model. Wedderburn kind of said, take this thing all the way to just a first and second moment, and then where you're linear in the y's. And then Crowder and Firth came out and said, well, maybe I can think about an estimating function that where I've got something linear in my y's, but then I also include something linear in, in the second moment, okay, the second central moment. I think there's at least one back there, there's one right over here if you want to grab it. Um, and so now I'm kind of equating my centered y squared to my central moment, my second central moment, and including that where I would now do simultaneous estimating, or estimation, okay, across both. Now what what would be the rationale for doing this? We talked a little bit about last time. The rationale for doing this is to try and increase some level of like, inefficiency. If you think about it, full likelihood is getting you most efficient, like make all your assumptions, get those things right. Drop it all the way down, get your weights approximately right. That kind of takes you, if you think about the analogy, back to the best linear and bias estimator result. If I had the variance specified correctly, right? I'm weighting by the inverse of the variance in Wedderburn here. Okay. And then what Crowder and Firth said was, well, let's, let's kind of maybe not go fully parametric with the full likelihood, but we'll think about simultaneously parameterizing both the first and second moments. And that will gain you back even a little bit more efficiency if you're able to do that correctly. The danger there, though, right, is now not only do I have to specify the mean model correctly, I've got to specify a model for the second moment correctly as well. So I parameterize that thing now, okay, in order to get consistency on both. And so that's, that's kind of the give and take on the robustness. That's what I mean down here by trade-offs between robustness and efficiency. And part of the reason that I'm talking about this right now is as we go to correlated data, you will see estimating functions that are just basically a function of yi minus mu i, linear in the yi's. But then you will we'll see situations where folks have tried to extend those things over to the second one estimators as well, to try and estimate that correlation parameter simultaneously as well, to try and buy back efficiency. Same trade-off is going to occur there, though. You might gain efficiency if you're right on the second moment model, but you risk being inconsistent if you're wrong on the first moment or the second moment. Okay. Good. Um, so, the question is, you know, if you've got, you basically have an infinite number of estimating equations that you can choose from, or estimating functions, I should say. 
So the question is, well, how do you choose? Okay. And so a lot of the work um, that's been kind of put in this is to try and think about, well, what are the optimality properties of particular classes of estimating functions? And so Godom and Hayde in 87, they said, well, let's consider a class of what they, they entitled linear unbiased estimating functions, which makes pretty good sense, right? It's linear in the y's. It's unbiased in the sense that if I take the expectation through, I get y minus its mean equal to zero. So this looks very familiar to your guys' form, right? The question is just, they, they said they, they allowed for a general AI there. Yeah, they could depend upon it for unknown parameters. And so what they had found was that in their 87 paper, the quasi-score, going back to Wedderburn, that thing that you guys have seen where I've got the nonlinear transformation of the mean linked to my linear predictor times the inverse, the inverse of the variance of yi, taking that to be my multiplier ai, or my weight, if you will, is optimal in the following sense. Um, it's optimal in this sense, right? So they said, well, okay. Let me standardize this guy first of all, so that I've got variance one. Okay. And so you're taking u over the expectation of du d beta. And then I'm going to take let g be some other member of that g star, that class of linear unbiased estimating functions. And so what they showed was these guys are, have expectation zero. They showed that the expectation of u star, that standardized value, is less than or equal to the expectation of g star squared. Okay. So what does that mean for us? Variance. Yeah, so it's the variance of the estimating function, right? Saying that that particular quasi-likelihood estimating function will give you smaller variance than any other member of that class, okay? Assuming I specified V correctly, okay? All right. Then they said, well, we also know something about the score function, right? We know that that's gonna be optimal. And what I mean by the score, I mean the true score. Like if you knew the likelihood, you were able to take the derivative of that likelihood with respect to the unknown parameters and obtain S and then standardize it. What they showed there was that the expectation of U star, again, the quasi likelihood estimating function, minus S star, that's again the best you're gonna do, quantity squared is less than or equal to the expectation of G star minus S star squared. What that means really is, you can think about this as like the closeness, right, of your estimating function relative to the optimal estimating function. And then thinking about, on average, you want to minimize this guy, right? You want to be as close as possible to the optimal estimating function. Everybody with me on that? Mm, yeah, so I have a question. Yeah. So, you, so oh, like the, first, the first condition says that the variance of this one will be smaller than any other um, member of the class. But the second one kind of looks like variance too. It's kind of like a variance, but it's really measuring your discrepancy between the optimal estimating function, right? S star is the optimal estimating function. I'm going to relate it down to not really a variance, but a correlation between these guys in just a second. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but think about this being distance, right? I mean, you're taking squared distance between your estimating the quasi likelihood estimating function and then the score, which you know to be optimal. Yes, Steve. Is that kind of related to like MSC and bias variance? Here kind of, yeah, exactly. So, could there be like a bias G that does better than the So, score? they're all unbiased for theta in the sense that they're part of that class. And so, so this actually holds for any member of that class. Right. But okay. So, it's not, there's not an unbiased one that's outside of it, could do better. Yes, so if you're outside of that class, they didn't make any statements about that, right? And in fact, S star may very well be outside of that class, right? If I'm not in an exponential family, S star can very well be outside of the class of linear unbiased estimating functions. You don't always get this form. For exponential families, we've gotten that form. It's led us to this guy, okay? But if I'm outside of an exponential family, I'm not guaranteed to have that particular form of form. okay? So yes, as I go outside of that class, yeah, I start to lose things. And this, this should actually sound familiar to you guys, right? We proved optimality within a class of linear estimators before. 211, Gauss-Markov, right? When we did Gauss-Markov, that's what we did. We said, let's focus on the class of linear estimators and walk through it. And we showed that, oh, OLS under homoscedasticity was optimal there. Okay. Okay. So, that's kind of a nice property there. It says that basically, you can think about this as getting closer. If you expand this guy out, run the expectation through, you'll see that this is actually an equivalent statement to saying that the correlation between, oops, I should have a star on there, put a star on there for me, between U star and S star 
is greater than or equal to the correlation between G star and S star. Again, the similar, if, if intuitively what you're saying is, is that you're approximating the optimal estimating function best with G star. Okay. In other words, that possible. Okay. Very good. Um, so what does that mean for us? That means that we're doing pretty well just by focusing on this class. Again, what I'm saying is it's justifying the fact that we are beginning with this type of estimating function form that's sitting here, okay? If I have anything that looks like I'm linear in the y's, okay, so a first order estimating equation, if you will, then this particular form, as long as I specify v correctly, is gonna get me as close to the optimal S star. In other words, the, the score function is possible. So it's justification for kind of focusing, starting here. You guys with me on that? And again, it should make intuitive sense for you. Yes, Marco. It, it should make intuitive sense, right? If I get that view correctly. I'm up waiting now, waiting for this one. Again, why focus on this class? Why not go outside of this class like Stephen was just talking about? The reason why goes back to Huber White because this will give me an unbiased estimating equation as long as I specify the mean line. So it's a sensible thing to think about, that class of estimating. Good. All right. So the other nice thing about this is we've already actually derived it. So under fairly mild conditions, right? Essentially, you need that u of theta is continuous, the covariance of u of theta converges to a matrix that's positive and definite. That's really what those regularity conditions that we've talked about in the past are really giving you. Um, then you can get asymptotic normality of the resulting estimator, so u of theta and the resulting estimator that comes from that class of estimating functions. Okay. And so how do you do that? Well, we actually sketched it out. So if you go back to lecture three, when I derived the Hebrew white result, that was exactly what I was doing. It was that first order Taylor expansion showing things going on. So it goes off to infinity that theta hat will in fact go off to a normal distribution. It'll be centered at theta star, right? Which again, in this case, it's just gonna be the value that leads this thing to be unbiased here. So taking the expectation through. And then it's going to have variance equal to a inverse or a inverse b a inverse. Right? Talk about the asymptotic version. Okay. So Fisher under the presumed likelihood, and then inside the true variance of the score okay. as you go through. So again, make sure that that is clear in your minds where that comes from. It's not magic. It's just a first order Taylor expansion, kind of applying the similar techniques we've had and likelihood theory as we go through. Okay. All right. So, again, if you think about it, just some comments on this, you've got an infinite number of estimating functions and estimating equations, ultimately, when you set the equal to some constant that you can choose from. Okay. So as you're thinking about them, what you want to think about is, well, what are the optimal estimating functions that you might consider? Okay. And what I've been talking about for you guys are what most people have considered a class of semi-parametric models. Again, when we think about this, we consider them semi-parametric. You're parameterizing the mean and specifying the relationship with the second moment. So you've got mu and you've got v, but then you're not specifying anything about the third, fourth, fifth, sixth moment.